Welcome, guys, to the All Ears podcast here with myself, Luke Barnett. This uh, podcast was started by myself because I wanted to learn more about the world. As I got into the fighting world and I became very good at it, the better I got, the more I found out that I had to learn. I felt like it's an endless journey of learning and becoming better. And now I've moved away from that and gone into the real world, if you want to call it that, or the business world and, and all these different angles of life. I thought I knew a lot about life and I'm learning that I know nothing. And uh, I try and bring interesting people on here to discuss different matters with, to try and learn. And hopefully you guys learn along with me. So let's get going. Okay, Joss. Hello. What do you think's harder? <laughs> Getting a fitness entrepreneur to make 10 grand a month or balancing a shot of tequila on your head so a big giant can shot it off the top? Uh, the thing is... <laughs> Balance a shot of tequila on your head takes a lot of practice to get to your first. Oh no, that take to get to your first ten grand takes a lot of practice too. Um, <laughs> I mean, balancing a shot of tequila is, is pretty. It's it underestimate how hard it is, bro. I, I was yeah. I was extremely <laughs> impressed. And also, you've got to take into co like consideration the environment you're in. You've got music, you've got people around you. It's hard. It's, it's, you've got to be aware, do you know what I mean? But you are aware. That's why, you, I think that's why you were ready for it. Yeah, you've got to be like zoned in, you know what I mean? You've got to be able to block out the outside noise, real focus. Get, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think good I could call. do it. <laughs> yeah, good call. Cool, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, years of practice to get there. Yeah. Um, I think I could probably do it, but I don't know anyone that could do a shot off my head. Was I still on the chair? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. No, but it's got a great squat in you as well. You <laughs> <laughs> but I, I saw you this morning in the gym. So yeah. even though traveling all over the world, doing your thing, starting businesses, running multiple businesses now, mm -hmm. you still find time to get to the gym because, you know, your physique is what, what, what got, where you, got you where you are, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's like having breakfast. I have to go. I don't want to go. You didn't want to go today. I saw that in your face. I was the same. I didn't want to go, but I, I, it's part of what I do, it sets me up for the day. But like you say, a lot of people get into fitness because they um, enjoy the perks of like looking and feeling good. But I think once that starts to hit, not as a hobby and as work, it kind of hits different sometimes. So it's very important that you actually do fitness to make you feel good and not as work all the time, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I had a quite a different journey, obviously through fighting, and I only trained anything ever in my whole life to be able to beat the shit out of someone. That's all I cared about. Killer. Yeah, kill, to kill someone. Yeah. Kill or be killed. I never once trained to look good. I never once trained to feel good, ever, until my career started to come to an end. And now I go to the gym solely because of that thing. I just go there because I don't want to become a fat bastard and out of shape. But it's so like difficult, I find it sometimes. So obviously, a lot of people come to you with advice about how do I stay motivated in the gym and all, all that stuff. But for me, I just think it's a it's a like I, I was up to 120 kilos about six months ago mm -hmm. looking not very good uh, I'm down a little bit now I was at, I was at like 25 24 percent body fat now I'm like 19 goal is to get back to 12 when I was fighting I was eight so like but that's all because of the distractions in the world that have hit me from giving up fighting moving into business trying to make money which is a big stress in your life but I've got a family so like how, what advice do you give to people to, to, to keep them grounded and keep them moving forward for the gym? What, to just stay focused and stay in shape? People overcomplicate it. That's what uh, winds me up a little bit. Like, you, like <laughs> or counting your macros, obviously you need to be aware of your calories, but if you are not, if you're around the 10% mark and you want to get lower, then it gets more advanced. If you're above that and you want to just feel better, get in shape, don't overcomplicate it. There's all these crazy diets out there. Put your fucking trainers on, eat less and just be consistent with it. But people do Monday to Friday being great, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just be a slob, you know? And that's still a lot of the week, you know? You need to be consistent. Treat yourself, of course, but it's the long game you've got to play. But people, they're too inconsistent with the small daily tasks. Like, it's lots of small things that build up. It's not like one huge movement. And when people do these uh, big eight-week transformations, like bodybuilders especially, they'll do it and get in amazing shape, but then they yo-yo throughout the year, which again, isn't healthy. But if you want longevity and to feel good, just do small stuff every day. Yeah, well, that's what we did like in fighting. My friend used to say that fighting was like an eating disorder with violence. 
because we'd spend three months, especially me, I used to fight 84 kilos. Wow. Um, as six foot six, the, the tallest middleweight in the world. And I used to drop 14 kilos in 24 hours in water. <laughs> Fuck off. Yeah, 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 it was horrible. How? Um, sweating a lot, a lot, a lot. So in the, we used to do, my weight cut would consist of basically not eating and drinking for a, 24 hours but I'd also then do sauna sessions and training in the sauna no you don't that, that's, what, that's what old school that's how you, you die you know, that's, that's, that's how you die but that's what you used to think old school like oh you need some activity in the sauna but if you're at 100 degrees you don't need any of that it's like I would submerge myself in hot water and put in Epsom salts and so you'd relax yeah, yeah. and you would sweat but it, a lot of it came down to the pre weight cut which was like water loading so I'd drink 10 liters of water four, five, six days before the weight cut and my body would be, get used to the water going through my system. And then when I came to the weight cut, I would submerge myself in water like a bath for 30 minutes, come out, wrap myself in hot towels for 30 minutes, go back in for 30 minutes, come out for 30 minutes. I'd do three of those and each bath you'd lose like a kilo and a half. And then after that, you, you I'd go sauna and, and design a little bit. How do you feel when you're doing that? I mean, it's pretty much like committing suicide and dying on a very, very slow death. So I imagine it's what it feels like to be in a desert. Um, by, you, by choice. By choice. And then you rehydrate and then you have a cage fight the next day. So it, it wasn't the... Uh, what did you put back on as soon as I, you've done your weigh-in? I would... F like I, so I fought 84 kilos. I would start the weight cut at 95 kilos. And when I fight, I would be anywhere between 96 and 97 wow. kilos. So I, I would be 15 kilos heavier than I was supposed to be when I was fighting. See, that in itself is nuts, like the stress. But the problem is, the guy I'm doing it, fighting, he's doing the same thing. Is that the same? I mean, not to the same. I, I was high end of the percentages. But so that as well, but then those three months training to have that fight, then after the fight, you, you, I would have starved myself to stay at the weight I was at. So then after the fight, you just eat like a madman. And like you said, yo-yo. Like you go from yeah. my weight, which I would just become a fat mess. And then I'd, I'd still always but train, all that sort of stuff. But you see that with the, the fighters now. It's completely unhealthy. But that's the difference between the level of what you're doing compared to like if you just want to maintain a good physique. It's small stuff. You don't need to do all that, you know. That's what you're doing is to be at the highest level of what you do. To kill someone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've got to do it but what's interesting what you said there like so i played a lot of rugby since i was like six until i was like 21. i wanted to a lot of people who i went to school with went on to play for england um i was playing for newcastle university and we got you kind of get offered the chance if you want to keep taking it seriously but then you've just gone to university i've just like started to grow up fill out a little bit Al alcohol you meet girls and it's just like <laughs> it was more just to like start to, to look good where you you kept your head down went into professional fighting and kept doing that and I feel a lot of people um, when they get to a certain age they'll stop doing that sport at that level and that they go down the route that I went down I was me my Chris all went down like a, a nightlife life <laughs> uh, that, it was just out all the weekend and it was just to look good mm -hmm. the training that's how it all kind of started but as you get older you realize that's less important and you want to do it to become feel good. I think it's short lived. Oh yeah. But but it's also a pretty good time for a short amount of time. I'm sure when you look oh. like you do and you're at, like on the beach, at, ripped out your mind, and you're just walking down the, the, the like you said with Mike and the boys, and you've got like a gang here. It's kind of like when we're fight, fighting, we're all tough guys hanging out together. You go into a club or you go anywhere, you get attention instantly. I can't imagine what it's like being looking like you guys and walking into a club. I'd never want to stand next to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, about to a few times. He's just a, he's just a freak in the best possible way. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, there's this tra it's training to to look good. It's, that is that is it actually. When you're in the head, you're walking into somewhere with all your boys, the banter's flowing. You're feeling good, looking good. It's that's, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's hard. I, I, it's hard to it's like that dopamine here in a different way, right? Yeah. Yeah, so and now you get that ex extension of that with social media, which I'm sure helps too, but it also helps business. So it's like the ROI of looking good and having a good physique and being in the gym. And I'm talking for like the young guys out there that don't understand it and how difficult it is. It's like the ROI for your health and for how you feel and for your business and for female attention. And for, it's huge, right? Everything starts with looking after yourself. The daily things that you implement 
with your discipline to look after yourself, you can then apply into your business and you're gonna start to look better. So you start to attract more people who you wanna be around and vice versa. Then you probably get into a business conversation with those people. So the whole thing starts from looking after yourself and being healthy essentially, you know? Yeah. But, which I think a lot of people, especially now, underestimate because you can sit on your laptop like trading and doing crypto in your room all day and not even bother about your health, but you're still earning cash. But then you're not gonna have the mindset to go out in public and, st and still like be someone. Um, what the word I'm looking for? Do you know what I mean? Like have have that confidence. Yeah, have the energy, the yeah. like magnetism to be able to speak, spend time with people, and people will come to you almost. Yeah, I think it sounds like being into fitness in that in that way is like a happy kind of cloud. Whereas for me, in fighting. You just said it like at 20, 21, I couldn't go out. It was like impossible because I, I, all I did was train twice a day, three times a day, every day. Mm. For female attention, I mean, I used to live and sleep on the gym floor. So even if I got the attention and I managed to say the line, walk up to them, talk to them and convince them somehow to come back to my place, headlock. my place, <laughs> <laughs> headlock in the gym, my place was a gym floor. I didn't yeah. have any income. I was living on 50 pound a week. I did that for years on years on years on years. So it was like a very dark path to go down to. And I think fighting, anyone who's in the fight business or gets to a good level of fighting, they kind of have, they're fighting something internal. That's what I believe anyway. And I, I, I always thought that about like fitness guys and, and bodybuilders. I always thought they had to push themselves to the level that they have to be at physically to look the way they do. Mm. There has to be something internal that they're battling. Do you ever find that? No, 100%. Um, I, yeah, I can relate. So I kind of started the gym when I was um, 17. Um, my dad died when I was 16. I got two sisters and my mum. And therefore I had to become the man of the house. I start, and I went to the gym not having a fucking clue what I was doing, but I needed to release something. And that was actually um, where I buried a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And it's so true, you do hear like, all people in the gym have issues. Yeah, that's probably one of the main drives of why people start, whether it's something traumatic, a breakup, breakup's a massive driver for getting in the gym because you want to feel better, look better. But then like there are the benefits of doing that, but you, you, can, you can either put that energy into something negative or positive. And I feel like exercising, there's, there's no downside to it. You know, you feel good afterwards. You never regret a workout and long-term benefits or they, they speak for themselves, don't they? So, so you feel like that, obviously that's a huge thing to happen at such a young age. You think that you funneled that energy for that like dark energy and you put it into the gym and that's like, was what really pushed you to become where you're at now, you think physically or? Yeah, I've, I'm a very, stubborn individual when it comes to myself and like I don't really share much emotion when it comes to that kind of stuff like I think my mum saw me upset once she's like what's wrong with you but I just go and bury it where I go on runs every day I, can't, I find it very hard to relax even now like she'll, like she'll see me I'll, I'll go I'll train seven days a week if I can uh, but I know I need to have a rest day purely because I, I've just brought myself up that way do you know what I mean and I felt for me being more powerful and feeling good, I was like, I needed to be the man of the house, even mm -hmm. though I was so young, you know? But like, yeah. Do you feel like growing physically that gave you more control over your environment? Or like you said, being the man of the yeah, house? Yeah, like, or? I remember my sister, uh, my sister's four years and six years older. Eldest one had this boyfriend. I was still, I was still tiny, I was pissed wet through. And uh, the, she had a boyfriend that came around to the house in this, Shit, I remember it was a really shit mini with stars all over it. He used to work for an estate agent. <laughs> He's called Matt. And he was just giving my sister a lip outside my house. And the fact that I just wanted to go out and floor him and then take him off the drive, I just, I just got him to leave, basically. That was like what I wanted to, I wanted to look after my, my sisters and my family. Even I was, I was like 17, 18 then. I was still mm. young. But someone had to do it because if I wasn't there. So, I mean, they're my sisters and my mom. There's no man in the house there. So I guess like for me to grow up and feel more powerful in case something did happen, that was one of the main reasons why I went to the gym as well. And then so from creating the physique and becoming Josh Mooney, then you moved into next way you got into it was more with like TV with the... Yeah, I mean, so thanks for the Twitter days, bro. Obviously, we, I got hired to come here by Phil. Um, 
he hired me off my, my Facebook profile picture, obviously had my top off. And then I got offered to go on a TV show, X on the Beach, the very first one. Now, I can't really knock these things because they gave me a platform which I've used correctly. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people went on these shows and thought they were going to be millionaires off the back of it, but didn't have... Um, they were too scared to go back to their bread and butter, which I never was. I always went back and I started training people. I was coaching people. And then I just used any traffic and drove it towards my business. Slowly but surely. It took a long time. But now we have a full agency where I can teach kids who are in my position to earn 10K within four weeks, which took me about like consistently to learn that from the PT gym floor to building an online business for like six, seven years. But now, well, now we teach kids to do that in like four months. It's amazing, you know? But that's kind of like fast forwarded the journey a little bit. But the TV was uh, a catalyst mm -hmm. to getting traffic and using it correctly, I guess. Don't get me wrong, it was the wrong traffic. It was 16 year old girls like following me on Twitter. But yeah, it was, um, I can't knock it because it's put me where I am today, I guess. It's part of the journey. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with um, that catalyst, I mean, I was on, we said the wrong audience, I was the same Twitter days. I was on a reality TV show called The Ultimate Fighter. I was, was going to say that to you. I thought yeah, it was so it was like The Ultimate Fighter 17 years and years ago. Like, um, And again, the wrong traffic, because it was just, if you talk about business now, that I have this business mind, which I never had before, because I was just honed in on being, fighting. All I cared about was fighting. I didn't care about making money, I just cared about fighting. Now, when I look at my opportunity that I had when I was on the Ultimate Fighter, and I used the right word, the platform that I was put on. And I think that's what the UFC is, that people don't understand a lot of the fighters. You, you get put on this platform that you need to then perform and do something, mm. create something. What do you think, because obviously there's a million guys out there that have got a six pack. Maybe not a million, but there's a lot. A lot of guys have their got six pack. A lot of guys in great shape. There's a lot of guys that get a lot of attention, but people utilizing that attention in the right way. How do you think you found your path with that and you understood that like, oh, getting attention now, I'm getting traffic now, this I can, I can do something with? And I, it's, I've always just kind of had this, I've always very, been very good at helping people. And I've always loved fitness. Um, I remember when I started training a lot of people that I realized I actually hated being on the gym floor because my passion became my work. And that's when I realized I needed to change something about what I do so I can actually spend more time of enjoying why I fell in love with the process of it all, of training, but help, help people. Um, sorry, what was the question there? What was the... I said, so how do you think, why have you managed to, with the platform that you were given by TV and how have, managed the, to convert? how have you managed to convert that? How did you even, have, for me, Again, when I was going through the fighter's journey, same as you were going through the fitness journey, if you want to call it that, my mind wasn't even on like That's it, converting passion, audience. Though, it? Yeah, my, I was I was 100% fighting passion, all I cared about. That's all I wanted to do. I wasn't thinking about how to utilize that platform to you know make me money or, or business or anything like that. So that's the point. So like, I needed to go back and fall in love back in, back in love with the process of what I why I originally started, mm -hmm. the passion of it. Like you, you are you doing it? You don't care about the money. But then as a byproduct, you'll start to help more people. More people will see you, which means you'll get endorsements, so on and so forth. And then you'll get money off the back of it. But you need to be in love with what you're fucking doing. Otherwise, if, like, if you wouldn't do it for a lifetime, don't, for, don't do it for a day. What's the point? Mm. Because you'll just fall off. You need to have a passion behind it. And that's why you were doing it, because you fucking love kicking their heads off people. You know what I mean? Well, I think what I found, what I found <laughs> yeah, I did. But what I found, I found the reason that this is maybe a bit deep for my own self, but retrospectively now looking back at my fight career, which I was going to say, come to you, like the reason I love fighting that I know now, that I didn't know then, I didn't know during it, I didn't know when I was in, in it, because I had like a brotherhood of people that were cheering for me. So my gym, my, my, my teammates, Jack, John, Tommy, the guys that were like in with me every single day. I slept on the gym floor, I lived in the gym, I was training every, you know, but the love for the sport came from the environment. Not for, it wasn't internal for me, that's why I've worked out now. It was having the, the, the brothers or the people that were looking out for me. Mm -hmm. And I have two brothers and I have a great family and I was raised in a great way. I didn't have anything like negative there, but I didn't have like the affirmation, if you want to call it that, from, from, from the outside telling me like, you're the man or whatever. Um, all my friends went off to university. I kind of felt a little, a little bit lost, a little bit left behind. And that's what made me find fighting. And what fighting really became for me was that. It wasn't had anything to do with kicking heads off people. I still enjoyed that. But 
it was the affirmation of other people looking at me being like, you can do it kind of thing. It was like other people pushing me forward. That's what I worked out. And I think that's why I got to a very, very high level in fighting, but I didn't get to the elite upper echelon. I think that's because it wasn't an internal journey. It was like an external one with people validating me. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, yeah, I think it's passion was definitely the reason for it. But I think, yeah, sometimes I feel like maybe you need a little bit extra. And I don't know if with you in fitness, if again, this is a very deep question, especially for a podcast. But um, if that, you think that was the reason, was it, obviously you said your dad died, which is a huge factor, but the validation from fighting for me was, was I couldn't get enough of it. So the validation for you from being the guy and, and everyone looking at you must be huge. I think there's definitely some underlying issues, what happens that I'm actually unaware of, that I want validation, that I need to prove people, I have got a thing about proving people wrong. And I've used that in, in the past to get where I want to be in, in business, just be like to get to a certain level and just be like, fuck you, do you know what I mean? Like, and, but like, I shouldn't think like that. Do you know what I mean? It's an unhealthy way of of thinking really. But if if it works, it works. Yeah, if it works, it works. I don't know. I think that's uh, maybe training from, from, from the outside, but like what's wrong with using a negative emotion that you have within you? Like, fuck you, I'm going to do this. As long as you convert that, mm. I think... And as long, I think it's, um, there's a famous, like I'm trying to put this right, but it's not about where you are. Like if your life's shit and you use the fact that your life's shit and you convert that into your life being good, then you get to look back and you actually quite enjoy that your life was shit. Cause you look at the time when it was like crap and you're like, oh, that, that, that. because it changed, because mm -hmm. something changed within you and you became better, you, you're okay to look back and think, eh, you know, and, and whatever. But if your life, st if you are still, didn't want that you didn't want that fuck you and you didn't become the businessman you become or you didn't make the money that you come you'd still your life would still suck so i think there's nothing wrong with being pushed by negative emotion i think that's something that's unhealthy yeah i, th I think the more traumatic um the more trauma someone goes through trauma is something that actually makes you feel uncomfortable because if you are comfortable you won't move and i think people sometimes need that shit and it'll, it'll, it'll flick a switch and it'll make you do something drastic to Im improve yourself, you know what I mean? Because if you are going through hell every day, you won't like it, so you will change it. But I feel like some people get to a certain level and then they get comfortable and then they, they just stay there. Yeah, I mean, I've, that's, that's described me over the last couple of years and I've tried to get away from that, trying to wait, get away from comfort. I think I, my life in fighting, I was completely uncomfortable when I was going up, 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 and then made a bit of money as so. well. It's quite nice. That's quite that's, nice. <laughs> that's one of the most dangerous things about becoming successful and getting recognition, being able to still have that obsession with where you want to be without getting comfortable. Because you can get to a certain level where everyone eats at the nicest restaurants, you can hang around the nicest people, yeah, but it's important to go home and still fucking get at it after work because, again, it's very easy to get comfortable once you get to a certain level. Like, you know, you go to Dubai, you're in the best place in the world, you're like, it's nice. But then you see someone else driving a nicer car and you're like, oh, I could do one of those, can't you? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't be just all about materialistic things, but it's having that obsession about where you're going to go. Just don't, don't let it slide. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you keep that on track? How do, for you personally, do you, again, you, do you set goals? Do you, is, there, is there a mechanism you have in place that you, you know you have this vision of this man that you want to become, but how do you keep that? Like you said, I know you live a very nice life, traveling all over the world, Dubai. Like I've been to very, very nice places, sit there and just feel like this, 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 is, this is good. Like <laughs> you, can, you can definitely get distracted by it. So how do you stop that from happening? You secretly hate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking in the mirror and you hate what you see. He's just like, you fucking get back to work. Um, I don't know, on a serious one, how do you prevent that? Uh, I think if you're already on that journey, you'll have something inside you. When you look in the mirror, you know you can do better every day. You know, uh, that, I don't think that process just happens overnight. You know, you know you're getting comfortable. So you'll probably have a word with yourself. Um, but again, you just... Come up with new, just keep evolving as well. The world's always evolving, so don't get left behind. Give yourself, set yourself new tasks, whether it's in your healthy your business, your relationship. You know, there's always somewhere you can improve. And I think if you're on that, you're that type of person, you'll find a way to keep improving, yeah, regardless of being comfortable for a little bit. You should. I'm a big believer of treating yourself. If, if you've done a good job, like give you some, give yourself some time back, you know, but then get back to work again. Yeah, I think um, that's something a lot of people forget. 
I, I forgot that in, in the fighting world again. I know I keep talking about myself, but I'm, I, love I, I, I do love myself. Love so it's fine. <laughs> um, but like, no, for me, I, I strive, 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 push, push, push. And in, in MMA, it's like you fight and then three months later, you got another fight. So it's like, and then it was the same fitness with competitions or whatever, but I would have my fight, I would win, I'd be happy for a day, 12 hours That's maybe. What you're saying though, it's, the, it's that, that, that um, chemical reaction you get in your head, you're going on fucking stage basically. Mm. This is your arena, you just kick the fuck out. It's like, the most manliest thing on the planet, bro. You're gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go back, you sat, you sat backstage, you're probably like, right, <laughs> what do I do now? Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And you're like, okay, when's the next one? Yeah. That's literally how it is. It's like you, you celebrate, you wake up the next day, your head hurts because you've been smacked in the face, your head hurts because you've drank liters of alcohol, at least in my case. And then you wake up and you think, I'm going to eat a pizza and then what the fuck am I going to do? Like, <laughs> I, 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 I just what? So then you're just thinking, when's the next day? Okay, I'm going to fight in three months. Okay, I'll take two weeks of a rest and recovery then I, and you get back on mission, right? So, but, but I, what I found fighting for me was, was easy. And then when I stopped fighting, it was like, there's, there's no three month loop, right? So then I, I need to be like or driven all the time every day and I'm, I'm not autistic, but I'm autistic to the point where I'm always trying to, I'm always looking to be 1% better, trying yeah, to improve yeah. this, improve that. But I spent maybe six to 12 months, 12 months probably like depressed because I didn't have that next fight. And uh, someone said this to me the other day recently. It was like, uh, everyone says fighters die two deaths. They die when they retire and then they die when they die, right? Because when you, do, you do, your whole identity is destroyed but someone called it social death, right? Which I had never heard before, but it's like death in the social realms. And I think this is something reality TV stars, you know, they'll, they'll be comparing to you, but that happens to them a lot. They get the limelight and they get the glory and then it goes away because like, yeah. who cares after a while, you know what I mean? Unless you continue to evolve, as, as you just said, and it's like they have that social death where their identity is kind of like slowly getting drawn out of them and that it can destroy them and destroyed me leaving, leaving fighting. So what made you, you know, like evolve and change and look, look, look to go towards business rather than become depressed, fat loser like I did for a couple of years? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my sister's ringing there. Um, I, it's because I always went back to what I actually loved. Using shows and getting Instagram followers, it was always a means to an end to use that traffic for something else. Because, um, like you said, I, a lot of my friends are on TV, done this, that, and the other, but they did nothing in between because they thought they were too good because they just went on TV for five fucking minutes. And they got a million followers, but they got fuck all in the bank account. And then <laughs> they're not using any, anything they've got to their advantage to create a business for the longevity. And that was always in the back of my head. I'd always go back to work. But I had no shame because I loved what I did. I think that's the difference. A lot of people who went on these shows were probably working uh, in fucking shops or Greg's or whatever. So you don't want to go back to work. <laughs> I loved what I did. So it was not a problem for me. So I always just went back and did, and then just wanted to keep expanding all the time. But there was a point in my life where I, felt, I did like mid twenties. I was like, I was kind of like felt a bit lost. I was, like, I was training people all day, every day. I was like, is this it? <laughs> is this fucking me? <laughs> but again, it takes a trigger to make something else work, you know? So well, there's plenty of 20 year old personal trainers out there that probably listen to this. So like if that, what was that trigger for you? Oh, that, that, you know, that it was, it was, I was trading my time for money. I, I fucking, I was on a gym floor. I'd be up at five in the morning and then the afternoon I'd have a little break and then I'd be training people to like nine, 10 at night. I, I had to go to a different gym to work out because I fucking hated the environment I was in. I literally hated it. And I was like, what's next? I'm at my ceiling because I'm working max hours in the day. I'm tired. I don't want to train myself. I was like, something has to fucking flip here. And I created a website started to drive traffic towards it. It was slow, fucking slow. I was like 30 pound PDF eBooks. I was trying to shift. Nothing happened for ages and ages. And then um, it was just consistency. Like end of the day, anything is, if you stick at something for long enough, you'll get traction. And that's what happened eventually. But I started to develop my systems um, and then eventually built uh, my own platform with a, with a software company who we're in partnership with now. So now we build apps for people uh, but I did that and then that was kind of like me making a full transition to going online so I took all the 
my PT clients start to do hybrid packages, wean them totally out of in person to online, which is, uh, I think a lot of people um, realize, need to realize. A lot of people, their clients, when you've got a trainer in the gym, they just want to speak to you. They don't fucking need you there. If you want to do the work and you want to get fit and you give them the perfect recipe, you'll bake the perfect cake, right? So, but people get lazy with that and they want to have this one-to-one -one, like little hoggy gay session in the gym. How can I say that? It's a bit <laughs> sensitive world, isn't it? But like, it's true. Um, but I speak to eight to 12 PTs every single day on, on my calls, um, trying to fix their businesses or build them a business. All of them, majority are overqualified, uh, but they don't have, have a clue how to get a fucking lead online. And it's scary because some of these people are amazing trainers, but they just don't know how, they don't know how or where to go to start to get their business online, to get them freedom back, to, to fall back in love with the process of why they started. Like they're just tired but they don't know how to do it. So that's where, that's why I get the enjoyment of what I do, to be able to provide a platform, show them how to do it, give them the guidance that I never got to get them where they want to be, you know, so. So, so you, I mean, obviously you sound and speaking like a very astute businessman using, you know, all these phrases, but did you study business before? A, no, just winged the whole lot. <laughs> I never had a sales call in my life, bro. And I remember Jamie, my business partner, he says, we're going to do high ticket. I went, what the fuck's high ticket, bro? Uh, he's like, we're gonna build a four month program, get someone, on, get someone on a call, get them to fill out a type form. You're gonna call them up and you're gonna sell uh, a 1600 pound package. I was like, how? He was like, I've written your script. We're gonna bang it out now. I was like, all right, fuck it. <laughs> Did a story, got a couple of hundred leads in, which is decent. And then in my first month, I did like 98 grand. And back then I was like, fuck yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is working. So then, one, we just started, it was just trial and error. I was, I wasn't great on my sales calls, but pe people buy into people and not what the offer is, which I learned. So if I can fix someone's problems emotionally, um, they'll buy into me, you know. But if you just, t if you're going to tell me that I'm going to get a nutrition training plan and check-ins, it doesn't mean anything. Anyone can get that anywhere if they like me on the call, which is important when you're in sales, and with anyone you work with, you know that's when people buy into you. And that's what I think that was one of my good traits where I can speak to someone, I can get to their problems and try and work out how we're gonna fix them in X amount of time. And that's why I was good. And then now we teach people to do what we do. So, so I mean, I've gone through a very, 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 pretty much identical experience when I had to get on the phone and make my first sales call. And I'm yeah. like, uh. <laughs> and then I remember my first call, I sold it, amazing. Mine was actually a very high ticket product. and. He was like, okay, how do I pay? And I was like, uh, <laughs> one sec. <laughs> and I had to, I, and I, but I, I couldn't, because I hadn't set it up because I was just making the call. There's a link that I could send for them to, to, to do the payment, but I hadn't built the link. Mm -hmm. So I was on the phone and messed up and said, I'll send you the link, like the moment we get off the call. You know, I'll get, get it sorted. Got off the call, sent the link, never heard from him again. So it's like, and we have to close people on the phone. It's on like the, the phone, num number yeah. one rule, right? Because he was in, invested, everything you just said, like he liked me as a person. It wasn't about so much about the course or anything else that was selling, it was, it was about me. Um, we connected really, really well. And when you get off and get a text saying, give me this much money, it's like, it's no weird. Bro. It's weird, isn't it? I, yeah. I've had some amazing calls with people. I'm like, in some situations, I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'll give you a message afterwards because something pops up, family have just walked in. Like a valid reason, but then they just dip afterwards. I'm like, oh, I, thought, I thought we were, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> I thought we were yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, no. To, to, to your question, I didn't have any training, which I just learned. Just learned it. A lot of it's just people skills. So how did you? It sounds like your business partner obviously played a big role in that. How did you find it? I think a lot of people struggle trying to find people to work with and partners and yeah. going into business together. So how did you find him? It's good that actually because a lot. Of, the time when you start a business, it's usually with one of your mates, which means they're similar, which means it's not gonna work because <laughs> you've both got the same attributes. I met him through um, two of my friends, one of Mike's friends as well, um, and he's their brother, he's our older brother, and he comes from a teaching background. He was a teacher, um, he was a PE teacher, and then so his attributes outweigh mine. I, I'm very good at more marketing side of things, bringing audience in, and he's very good at fulfillment, uh, but together, like it just, it's a really good match. So. Yeah, we just kind of 
working things like that. But how, how did you find him? How, how did you guys? You said he's. Oh, I'm, fr- I'm friends with his brothers. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's one step away from family and friends, but it, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's where a lot of people get things wrong when they're starting businesses. I, I. Two clothing lines that were just not great. Like I did it because I was like, oh, I want to make my own clothes somewhere and everyone else is all the time. And then um, realized my friends, like he was just wanted to do all the stuff I was doing. So I was like, we're missing out, like the fulfillment. We've got to do the, find the suppliers, the orders, all that kind of stuff that you don't want to do the admin. Um, so you wanted to do the, the, the bit that you're both good at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one doing the stuff you're not good at. Yeah, so that's why it, it works well with me and Jamie. Yeah, well, I think... Um, you know, for most people, like I'm talking to, thinking about PTs out there myself now, or guys that are trying to get into business for, to, oh, to, right. to like, if you're a guy trading your time for money, you said it normally, like you're trading, you're, you're fully maxed out, you've got all your hours. If you're able to get all your hours filled out in a gym and have PTs, that means people like you. And I think, because I, I did a bit of PT and during COVID as well, mm-hmm. I mean, people love me, so I'm fine. But um, it was like, you can if you can fill out, physical space and you can fill people and they can actually spend their time with you then you have a skill where you can sell you definitely can sell yeah so you said you're you, you connect with people well you would have learned that from from selling clubs in marbella when you were 20 to, to then doing pt and, and speaking to people about their problems and basically being a therapist for for a personal training session like i feel like that communication is the number one skill that you need to learn and if you're a good pt you should never be afraid of like utilizing that skill in on the phone, via text message, on emails, all these sort of things. It's just it's a different medium, like different media that you're using for the same skills that you've already built. It's, it is actually quite tough because you need to be confident, but confidence only comes from repetitions of what you're already doing. You need to know what you're talking about, but to have lots of clients in the gym, that's organic traffic, that's footfall coming into the gym so you can grab them. But if you're going online, you need to create your own niche so, and your niche is what you are. So you can go through the struggles of where you've got from A to B. So fixing your prospects, problems essentially, right? But then you've got to get good at content. You've got to have the right content, give some value. You know, which way I find a lot of people struggle because they're not comfortable in front of a camera. But I say to them all the time, you probably weren't comfortable when you first stepped in a fucking gym but here you are, but people need to get over that, especially with all the tools and access, the accessibility we have today. We have everything at our fingertips. So all you've got to be is come up with a plan, which we give you, execute it consistently, and then you, like, <laughs> you will get to where you want to be. But people get lazy. Like, if I stopped because I had a, f- like a few fails, at the start of my business, I would never be in a situation where I can now coach coaches to get to their first 10, 20, 30K a month, you know? And people are moaning to me on the phone, like, I'm not, this isn't happening because I'm not good at this. I was like, fucking grow up, just keep doing it every day, you know? I didn't have anyone telling me what to do or giving me any mentorship, I just did it. Like, are you in it to, because you love it or are you just trying to do it for cash? If you're doing it for cash, you're not gonna get very far. This is fair. Yeah, I completely agree. I think what I always, what I thought to myself is you can continue going down the road that you're going as a PT, training mm-hmm. your time for money and you can make a certain amount of money or you can put all of your, or some of your energy into this business, which is going to become, I mean, it's not quite passive income, but it's going to become income where you're not trading for your time for your money. And even if you make 50 quid, but you don't have to do anything for it. Yeah, It right. feels like 500, you know what I mean? Because you're like, okay, so I, I built out my system, I built out mm. my product, I'm now selling that thing, and I just kind of sit here and it, oh, I, it sold. Oh, and something else sold. And I haven't had to physically do anything because all the work has been done and the systems have been built and the team is in place. So it's like, once you go down that road and the money starts coming in, it, it's like you can see the future where you can stop trading your time for money and you can just do this thing. But I think what people don't realize is if you don't try at the beginning and you don't fail and you don't keep going, then you're always gonna just be doing what you're doing anyway. So it's like, if you don't wanna trade your time for money, you don't wanna be in the gym from five till 10 at night, you have to do something different. And this is what blows my mind about, not not PTs, but about nine to five workers. They all talk about side hustles, all this crap that you see on the internet. It's like, 
you either do it or you stick, stick to your nine to five. Like pick, pick, pick what your life's going to look like. You either want your life to look like everyone else's or you want to, your life to look like Joss in Dubai, sitting there, chilling out, having fun. You know, like there, there's two choices and it comes down to where you want to put your energy. You know what I mean? So I think for these guys, it, it's, it's, it's scary, but the other choice is what? That's what you need to be. If you bet on you... You've, you've got to make it work. People who have nine to five jobs, they go on about safety. You ain't safe, you work for someone else. If you ain't got, a, if you've put everything on in, in your basket, you've got no other option but to make it fucking work. Otherwise, you'd be homeless. But I think that comes, to, <laughs> comes down to self-belief, right? Yeah. So how do you foster self-belief or self-confidence? I mean, you're obviously a very confident guy. So how do you foster that? And how do you create that, you think, for Maybe these guys? Maybe used to be, bro. I was like... A, a dweeb at school. I was so, so I was the smallest guy. I used to play rugby and everything. I used to get fucking like I was tiny. I used to get beaten up all the time. <laughs> and I think that's what like why what probably made me want to become who I am. You know, um, I think it ha again it has to probably come from something that's happened in your life to get there. You know, again people working uh, doing nine to five they're, they're probably comfortable, which is a scary fucking place to be in. But then they're the people who give you the most shit as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think life kind of works slowly. So like you, if you become comfortable, life gets harder and harder and harder and harder, but you lose the ability to adapt to life because you've just stuck at one thing. So if you get that nine to five job and you're comfortable and your mortgage is paid and your kids are fed and everything else, it's like, cool. But then if something changes in the world, like they introduce AI and you lose your job, so I, well, you, you don't have that, that move, movability because you haven't bet on yourself, you've bet on someone else. So it's like, but I think for people to be able to bet on themselves, they need to stack up victories, they need to, they need to build self-confidence. So I just think you, like you said, you weren't a confident guy. How do you think you found, what, did, what, what made you, into, what gave you I confidence? Think what I went back to is that it was the, all the digs and the shit I can remember from certain people. I'm like, fuck you. Do you know what was really nice? It just come to, my, <laughs> to, come to my mind. I went to a wedding, uh, one of my old school friends, and I went back, um, it was like a year and a half ago now, and I just went in, rolled up in my SVR, <laughs> and a tailored suit on, came in, and I looked around, and I was like, oh, <laughs> everyone's fat, gone bald. And trying to speak to me about what they do, um, and they're all just kept asking me what I'm doing because they see they see this life. But it's not in like a big-headed way. It, it was actually like what happened. I was and I felt uncomfortable talking about what I'm doing. Like I didn't want to. Felt like I was bragging. And that for me, when I saw like one of the lads who was a dick to me at school, I was just I was just polite to him. I was just nice. But all those digs I remember when I'm going through this process. So I feel like. People have to go through the hardship and turmoil if they want to be somewhere more than where they're at. Use it. Use that pain. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think I've gone through some of the things that you said with, with, with people that used to look down on you. Mm -hmm. Now they look up to you if you want, you want to use that. And it's like those are the people that maybe weren't, didn't have problems at school. Or the life was easy, if you want to call that, for them. And then they became comfortable and then they stopped trying. I think a lot of people just stop trying. They give up on, on themselves and they just kind of... Like, and it's, it's embarrassing to see for me. I, I can't it's see that classic it. story of that, the high school king. That's where he gets his dopamine fix from. from just being a twat <laughs> to younger people. But then after, after school, high school's finished, whatever it is, that's where, that's where they die. No, I said it. <laughs> but I think now this, I call you an influencer. Is that the phrase you use? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so what, do, what do we call you? No, then? but like obviously got a good, a good following, but I, I don't, I turn down so many jobs, everything. I don't want to do anything that's not on my path of where I want to be. And what, so what is the path? Just to keep building, elevate to help. I mean, there's over 600 clients there. And at the moment we'll get to, I want to get to a thousand um, and just help as many people that are in my position. And do you know what's nuts is I, I speak to people and I, I, I post figures online and people are like, oh, it's a scam, this, that, and the other. I want to make an offer so good that you feel so stupid saying no to it. Because if I, I know I've, I've pitched something to you and I know it can work for you, I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel bad about if you don't sign up because I know I can help you. That's your loss kind of thing. So I just want to keep helping as many people from the position that I was in that took me so fucking long to do that in 
like the space of four months. I've got 20 year olds doing 10K a month, which is like unbelievable. If I was doing that at 20, I don't know, where, I'd love to think where I'd be now. Or like we had a homeless guy, bro. He's nuts. He's a guy called Danny Hayes. I love him. He's uh, been with us for about nine months now. He was uh, in the army, got stabbed in the neck, discharged, dark past, drugs, alcohol, uh, managed to scrape some cash together, stayed on his mate's sofa, uh, got a loan and uh, signed up. Did 10K in his first month. He was doing four and five figures every single month for the last nine months, essentially. And we've we just built him his own app. And he was on the phone to him like three days ago. And he, was, he didn't have a house this time last year. <laughs> It's mad. That's fucking why. Let's give me goosebumps. Look, that, that's fucking why I love what I do. Yeah, like it's, it's it, that's that feeling sick. Like. I think that for for people listening to it, it's probably unbe unbelievable. But I think when you have the tools and the understanding of how to make money, especially online, with, with the, it's like what people don't understand is there is billions of people in the world. You know, like billions. So if you have a service that you can sell online, you have billions of customers to sell it to. Yeah. Whereas before. You used to have to open a shop and hope you get the footfall in at the gym or whatever you're going to say. Crazy to think that, isn't it? So you've got like 2,000 people you can maybe sell your service to. Okay, now you can sell your service to billions. Mm. So even if you drop your price or whatever you decide to do, it's like the marketplace is so big. And I think that's a lot of people try and hold, you said about giving value earlier. A lot of people try and hold on to value. They don't want to give it away for free or they don't want anyone to know because they think, oh, don't competition. All sorts of stuff. There's no competition, bro. There's, <clears> there, there's billions of people that need that need something. So there, how many people out are there selling, you know, like fitness plans? We were talking about Mike Thurston earlier because mm. I, I use his app, right? And so it's like, but there's billions of people and there's millions of, um, hundreds of people giving away fitness apps and there's market big enough for everyone it's not like mike's taking the, the share lion's share of the market i mean he might be a good looking bastard <laughs> but you know what i mean it's like people have to get over this fact of um trying to, to to hold on to things i think that's i think people can smell that you know i think you can see that people are selfish and people aren't doing it for the right reasons and that they're the people that are only doing it for the money because they're not trying to help anybody yeah i think you should give as much as way for free as possible without selling your whole package essentially do you know what I mean give stuff for free because it builds trust if you build a trusted community they'll purchase everything else you've got to offer because they already trust you because they, they see the value in what you're doing you know people are too scared to give much away especially online I think I think spoke about business it's fun everything else spoke about being in shape I'm going to be in shape soon promise but you're in shape bro. I'm in shape but I'm going to be in better shape um, well, Mike's up <laughs> I'll be 12% body fat by the that end of the year. That must be depressing looking at pictures of Mike while you're working out. You're like, <laughs> inspiring, bro, inspiring. I'm going to look like that soon. Um, I'm going to unfollow him. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fed up looking at his photos, mate. Um, let's talk about birds, right? So we'll finish with birds. So we've got, we've done, we've done, we've done like, you know, being Joss and being, being in shape and how like the biggest ROI in life, I believe is going to the gym and being physically, mm -hmm. you know, we said all the things they can give to you business and how you've, you've taken your mindset with that 20 year old in Marbella trying to get people into nightclubs topless, right? That's what you said you did. Oh, bro. <laughs> I've, uh, some, all the haircuts are going through my mind when I was that age, bro. I look like I used to get called Lego head. <laughs> like, you know, one of those things yeah, just yeah, click yeah. on and off, bro. It was awful. Um, yeah. So I moved to Marbella. Uh, I was top hosting with Mike in um, Newcastle University. That was our weekend job. That was fun. Uh, we used to get paid, used to get paid forty pounds for the night, but free booze, so all, the, all, got, all good. And then I went to Marbella for like a few seasons. Um, I think this is what I, one of the main things that actually helped me my charisma grow. I remember I was down on the port, and uh, Phil, who hired me, gave me a bunch of flyers. He goes, "Right, I want you to hand them out to girls to get them into the club." And I remember I I, I was like. Um, do you want to you want to come down to like news car and, and I, I was scared I didn't have that I've never been put in a public place where I had to deal with that before but I think that's one of the main places that made me grow as a person with my charisma but um, yeah I stayed here for like did three summers yeah it was um, it was fun <laughs> stay the least got a lot out of my system and um yeah I'm a, I'm a grown up today uh, yeah I was gonna say <laughs> so so uh, this is cool quite i mean i'm married i've got two kids it's a different discussion but like i quite it's like like talking about this when you're young and obviously you're just trying to go for numbers maybe let's call it if you want to do that but then as you grow up i think what most men don't understand is you need to disqualify women more than qualify them does that make sense so mm -hmm. it's like if you know if people don't know what they want 
it's easy to know what you don't want or what you don't like in females. And then from that, uh, once you meet them and you get to know them, you can see, right, uh, they call it red flag, right? Red flag, red flag, red flag, or green flag, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you're still searching for the, 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 the woman of your life. She's sitting no, here, no, but it was odd. She had a really interesting conversation uh, yesterday about a lot of my ex-girlfriends have been foreign, right? And because I work from home, I don't really actually get out to meet one-on-one -on -one that often. So you'll meet people online and then you'll meet up and realize they're just full of red flags and they're not for you. That was the usual case for like a lot of my ex-girlfriends. They weren't from the UK or I didn't meet them in person first. I met her in person first and it, it's, it's a game changer for me. I don't think she would have replied to me if I just DM'd her anyway, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, I think that's where a lot of people go wrong nowadays. They start searching for things online when you actually need to have an organic uh, introduction. Yeah, I think I think dating. I mean, again, I've been out of the game for a while, so dating now seems to me Fucked. super, yeah, like a nightmare. Fucked. Like the Tinder and all this crap. They be, it just seems like how can you meet a genuine person that you you gonna get on with and gonna enjoy time with when you just everyone's Instagrams. I don't want to call it fake, but it's like positioned it's in a way to, to, yeah, yeah. to look perfect and be the best that you can be. Even like not just talking superficially the way they look, but like the places they are and the things that they're doing. And, you know, it's like the best, 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 best versions of us, right? So to under, like, how do you think, oh, obviously you said you, you, you found it in real life, but how do you think men, average men, because you're not an average guy, so like uh, what for an average guy trying to find women, how do you think it's... Uh, they can, can make that happen. You've got to work on yourself first. Yeah. Too many people try and chase love before even making themselves worthy of it, you know? Like, it, it's almost a distraction from their actual life. But if you work on yourself first, make yourself a fucking animal in, like, physically, in business, whatever it is, you'll attract the right person. And also, you, <laughs> you're not giving... <laughs> When you're when you're searching for love, you're look you're you're giving you put in someone else your emotions in someone else's hands basically, you know, not not someone's comes att like attracted to you. Uh, what am I trying to say? Like you're giving, you're just looking for the wrong things in life. I think you need to work on yourself first to attract what you want. Like, because after that honeymoon phase, if you've just gone searching for love, she's going to get bored of you, and it's all going to go tips up. You need to have a bigger meaning in life. So that would be my advice to anyone who's trying to find find someone that you want to be with they will come but only when you've worked out who the fuck you are i think that's uh very 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 good advice and i also think from a man who's been in a relationship for a long time what most guys i see happen is they find that girl they think that's the perfect girl and then they start changing who they are to yeah. please her and then she doesn't like him anymore because he's not the man that she thought she, he was because he's now become like less of, a lesser version of himself, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. I believe like relationships are built for, uh, you obviously attract each, attract each other by being the best version of yourselves, but you have to be happy first. You have to, like, rather than trying to make her happy, try, rather trying to search for her, like you just said, rather, it's like focus your energy on yourself. And then when she comes along, obviously, be nice to her. I'm not saying don't be nice to her, <laughs> but I'm saying you are still the most important thing in your life, and she's the byproduct of your be. life. Because uh, otherwise, you end up focusing your energy on her and, and and losing your energy on yourself, and you become a lesser version of yourself. And that's where I see a lot of couples break up because they're like, "Well, you're not, you're not, you're not a man that I met." So like, no, because I changed for you. That, that, honestly, that happens all the time. Yeah, you yeah. should just focus on yourself. Do exactly. I think I think what you said was spot on, um, and I think. There's so much more, we'll call it leads, you know, because we've been talking about business. There's so many more leads you can generate with females now. A lot of lead gen. Yeah. A lot of lead gen. So if you become that guy and you focus on becoming the, the best version of yourself, that lead generation part will take, take care of itself. Yeah, but then you can be very selective of who you want to work with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where it comes <laughs> like the, the, It's the, the same as business as it is in like relationships. And you need to find someone who balances you out as well, you know? I think disqualifying them is that's when you get the the, the uh, luxury yeah. of rather than trying, try, oh, come, come, couple, you're like, no, yeah. no, 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 not this one, not this one, not this one. You seem right for the job. You seem right for the role. Let's let's have a trial. I told, I told her when I met, I was like, I fucking deserve this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I deserve this. I was like, I've been waiting for, I've been waiting for this. 
Yeah, well, hopefully we got there. Right? Um, all right, Joss, I think it's um, been a fantastic conversation. Yeah. It's good to get to know you a little bit better. I wish you all the best with Elevate. If you want to tell um, the audience who you are, where they, where they can find you, where they can find your business, all that sort of stuff, like where to follow you. And then uh, we'll put all the links in the description anyway, but just so they can hear it from awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, so if, if you do want to follow me, it's Joss underscore... Wait, is it? <laughs> What's my Instagram? I've got, I've got like six Instagrams on there, all business accounts. All right, if you want to go to Elevate, if you're a PT, to be honest, fuck, fuck my Instagram. If you're a PT and you want to learn how to scale your business or you should want a chat about where to go within the fitness industry, I'm more than happy to help. If you go to Elevate underscore underscore agency uh, on, on Instagram, drop us a DM and myself and one of the team will get back to you. Sweet. Okay, thank you very much, Joss. Great chat. And uh, I'll see you guys next time on All Ears.